Okay, the doomsday clock advances. Uh, let me just unplug this. We don't need sound. Um, the doomsday clock advances, utopia, apocalypse, and the future. Now, do you know about the doomsday clock? It's been going since 1949, I guess. And uh, the, the bulletin of the atomic scientists has this clock, and presumably, you know, apocalypse comes when it's straight up midnight. And they, they determine how close the minute hand will be. So recently, on January 22nd, 2015, they moved the hands to three minutes to midnight, which is the, the, the closest it's been to midnight in a long time. And I'm going to tell you the two reasons that they did that, but I'm also going to describe a third, which I think you'll find both dis disturbing and surprising, that they didn't mention, but seems to me to also justify that. Now, just before doing that, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I grew up in a little farming town in New York State called Avoca, New York. And growing up, uh, kids would play a game in a circle. You'd uh, look the other kid in the eye, uh, the side of you, uh, and say, this is a sad and serious occasion. And if you smiled or laughed, you had to leave the cir circle. And interestingly, almost everything that you might find as a sort of mainstream part of your life today you would find on Google and on the internet. That's not there. So it's a part of my life that thus far hasn't reached the internet. There are other similar games to, to that. But just think about that. This is a sad and serious occasion. Because is this, this lecture, this experience you're having right now, a sad and serious occasion? Because if it is, then you are not going to enjoy this. You're not going to trust me because basically you trust speakers that give you a positive message. You, you, you may think that you trust people based on whether they're trustworthy, but you can easily show in, in, in studies of large numbers of talks that actually if the person gives a positive message, you're more or less convinced by that, and if they give a uniformly negative message, you don't trust them, and you don't like the talk. So this song you're, you're probably familiar with, Don't Worry, Be Happy, that's actually the kind of message that people like from a talk. So that's ultimately what you will get from this talk after the first 13 slides. But let's go through those first few slides. What are the reasons that the hands were moved so close to midnight by the League of Atomic Scientists, Bulletin of, of the Atomic Scientists? They felt there's increased risk of nuclear war. There's a lack of progress on global warming. Both of those are true. Those were the main reasons that they put the clock hands ahead. But that's not the reason that I support moving the clock hands ahead, and that is uh, ISIS. If you read the opinion of any world leader on what ISIS is doing and uh, you know, what motivates them and so on, it seems like we are in a very, very dangerous time where world leaders don't understand ISIS at all. And I would recommend if any of you are reading outside of your field, outside of medicine, and you haven't read this article in, in the Atlantic called What ISIS Really Wants, you should read that. It's very surprising because you and probably most world leaders would assume, for instance, just as you assume with the people around you that they're motivated by money and politics and don't really like that about them, ISIS is not motivated by money or politics at all. They forbid politics. If you're an ISIS, you can't vote 
in any democratic process, you can't run for, for office. That is forbidden. And many wealthy people, people who are already wealthy, become ISIS terrorists. They're, they're not motivated by money. It's a pure ideological motivation. And they're not motivated by progress either. They don't like progress. They would hate this holiday of future day. They want to go back to the seventh century. That's, that's really what is ideal for them. And what about this idea of the you know, apocalypse, uh, doomsday? They are looking forward to being in this apocalyptic conflict with a large entity like the UN or the US or something really big of, of, of being in that final battle at sort of end times that really appeals to, to them. So what I'm talking to you now about is something that they think about every day that motivates them. Let's set up this apocalyptic battle. This is what we're preparing for. This is the big deal for us. And I think most world leaders do not get this. And so it is dangerous when we're in a circumstance like that where there is this group that is behaving in, in a manner that is different in terms of the motivation from any other human being you know. You don't know anybody who is not motivated by politics, by the need for progress, moving technology, moving science for, forward, and who wants to be part of the political process so they can win you know, elections and be represented at the UN. This is the world you know. That's not the world of ISIS. <clears throat> OK, some other things about uh, apocalypse, the basics. Do you know what brimstone is? because everybody talks about fire and brimstone. Well, what is brimstone? I mean, it seems like you need to know that. Brimstone is sulfur, but it's particularly the sulfur in vo volcanic lava. So that's what they're talking about. It smells bad, and it's red and molten, and it, 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 anyway, that's what brimstone is. And where shall we start? The apocalypse is a very complicated subject. It really antedates religion in that there was this feeling that there could be this terrible, terrible end of things, even before most organized religions. But let's begin 92 years ago, in 1923, with this Robert Frost poem. Now, if you don't know any other poems and you just learn this one, that's good. Because this is regarded as one of the best poems ever written. And, and it sort of changed you know, what poetry was. And it's perfect in a lot of ways. It's called Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. Now, where did this poem come from? Its background is well documented. It comes from Canto 32 of Dante's Inferno, which you know was written in the 1300s. Dante was born in 1308. And so somewhere, it's not known exactly at, at, at what uh, age he wrote this. And uh, the worst offenders in hell, this is the idea of fire and, and ice. Want to let Ross in? <clears throat> so the worst offenders in hell were the traitors. And the traitors, all the way down at the bottom, there are these nine levels, and the worst uh, offender um, were, were the traitors who were not only in this terribly hot place, but frozen 
in such a way in a lake bound up with ice, um, very clear, but, but their heads were sort of stuck in ice in, in the middle of this terribly fiery place. So that, the idea of fire and, and ice in terms of the literature background, but what about personal interaction background? So Robert Frost had a significant conversation with sort of the Carl Sagan of that day, the most famous astronomer of, of uh, that period of time, 1923, Harlow Shapley. And Shapley describes an encounter he had with Robert Frost the year before he published this poem. And um, Frost asked Shapley how the world would end, and Shapley responded that either the sun will explode and incinerate the earth, or the earth will somehow escape this fate, only to end up slowly freezing in deep space. And Shapley was <laughs> surprised to find this poem appearing just a year after that conversation. And, and uh, he, he considered this as an example how science can influence the creation of art or clarify its meaning. OK, so Dante and uh, the circles of hell. Now, you may have noticed this perfect poem has nine lines. And Dante's hell has nine circles. Um, and these are what, what they are. Now, you may identify yourself as more likely to end up in one of these than uh, another, but they're limbo, lust, gluttony, greed, anger, <clears throat> heresy, violence, fraud, and treachery. Treachery is that most serious of all. And here are some more details of exactly what happens to you, depending upon which of those uh, offenses you have committed. And it's very, very detailed, but every single outcome sounds amazingly unpleasant. So um, it, it uh, doesn't really matter, uh, probably, which, whichever outcome uh, is, is, is not going to be very nice. Um, it, corrupt politicians, for instance, are immersed, immersed in a pool of boiling pitch. Um, and you, you can see you know, bad people that you know, they'd all fit in a specific category. And what's going to happen to them it is, is uh, very, very unpleasant. Now, with technology running amok, there are various popular scenarios we talk about a, a lot. One is unfriendly AI. And one is nanotechnology gone wrong with gray goo. And this is uh, probably familiar to you, the idea of gray goo that eats up all carbon-based stuff, so there's nothing left. Um, and the idea of uh, unfriendly a AI that, that leads to, to the extinction of mankind is also probably familiar to you. Now, there is a literature that I think you've probably all maybe become aware of, that I believe that in this course, we can make sure that this literature is completely irrelevant. And that is the literature of what the Earth will be like when the human beings on it suddenly cease to exist. And you'll find all sorts of do documentaries on YouTube of, you know, if human beings suddenly cease to exist. This is what would happen. This is what the animals would do. It's how long it would take for there still to be a sign that human beings had been on the planet and, and so on. Does that seem important to you? It's important only if it's going to happen. And I think that would mean that every single human on the planet ceases to exist or leaves, right? And it seems to me that's extremely unlikely we could make it unlikely. And so those documentaries are not important, assuming we, we can prevent that from, from happening, that we almost certainly can. 
And, and I, I suppose that's, in my mind, one of the purposes of the course, to, to, to make sure that we prevent something like that. These things are so dire that you need some comic relief. And for those of you that don't know the movie Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters 2, you, you, you need this. And for instance, when you know about that then, you know about what is the counterbalancing thing to gray goo. You have gray goo, and then you have pink slime. And pink slime is psychomagnotheric slime. It's very well described in Ghostbusters 2. And uh, then this becomes a little bit fun. You realize, well, maybe this is not entirely serious, and that's OK then. And the other thing that's interesting is the sci-fi timeline. Every sci-fi movie you know of generally identifies which year it's taking place in. And we're in 2015. And sci-fi movies have been produced for quite a while. So there are a number of sci-fi movies that actually were said to have taken place in 2015. Back to the Future 2 and RoboCop were both said to occur in 2015. And it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, of course, you can go back to Clockwork Orange. It was said to occur in 1995. So, um, and for instance, Total Recall, uh, well, Minority Report was said to occur in 2054, 2054 Total Recall 2084. Um, we, it's interesting to think about how soon we, we will encounter things like what we saw in those sci-fi films. Uh, AI was 2101, uh, The Matrix was 2199. I don't know how, how accurate these are. OK, so much for evil and darkness. Let's con concentrate on goodness and light for the rest of the talk. So you, you can imagine a situation where disease ends. All the diseases we know of today are either completely preventable or gone. And so this exponential curve of, of uh, uh, price performance of computing, which also translates in, in, into uh, exponential progress in many other ways, what it would mean in medicine is that we end up with a profession of medicine where the main purpose is human enhancement improvements in individual human beings, improvements in society. It's not just physical, it's moral, spiritual. Um, so the, the, um, that would, would be what medicine is mainly ab about when diseases uh, no longer exist. Um, <clears throat> Also to think of the common error of linear thinking, uh, the you know, trajectory based on present growth rate, trajectory ba based on past growth rate, both of those are seriously wrong. The correct prediction is much more rapid progress than either of those by uh, exponential terms. <clears throat> and this could be very, very favorable for us. Want to read about that in detail? There's Peter Diamandis' book, uh, Abundance. Um, the utopian singularity outcomes would include the end of disease, would include everybody being able to talk to everybody else. This is predicted to occur in 2021, which is not very long from now. That <clears throat> there will be such perfect automatic translation that everybody will be able to talk to everybody else and our lives will be made much richer. 2045 is only 30 years from now. That's when the technological singularity, when machines are smarter than the whole human race is supposed to occur. What will medical careers be like then? 
As I said, all natural diseases we know of today could be gone then. <clears throat> but that may leave as much for physicians to do as there is today. Challenging responses to bioterrorism and stem cell technologies. Focus of medicine could no longer be disease, but enhancement, elevating the human condition. But you can also think of a circumstance where if bioterrorism is particularly successful, there are more diseases than there are today, but they're all man-made and by definition largely untreatable. Uh, so that is also a, a potential outcome. Social responsibility would be an important aspect of medicine and one is one of the focuses of the course. That idea came from Rudolf Virchow, who said it's the curse of humanity that it learns to tolerate even the most horrible situations by habituation. Physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor. Think of what that means. And the social problems should be largely solved by them. Well, I think most physicians today don't think they're the natural attorneys of the poor. They're something different. But, you know, probably the, the poor need natural attorneys, and it's related to health. You, you can easily show that there are social determinants of health. Rudolf Virchow was 27 when he wrote this. He lived to be well over 80. He had the most spectacular 80th birthday party, and so he's often shown as an old guy with a beard. But all these famous sayings were written when he was 27. Medicine is a social science, and politics is nothing else than medicine writ large. Medicine <coughs> as a social science, as science of human beings, as the obligations to point out problems and to attempt their theoretical solution, Politician, the practical anthropologist, must find the means for their practical solution. The interesting thing about Virchow is he was successful in all three of those fields. He was a successful politician. He was a mayor. He, he had other political successes. He founded a new branch of uh, anthropology, and as you know, he founded cellular pathology. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> so, I have always felt that the, that the normal, outgoing, personable students in this course is sort of a force for good. You know, if you, you, you think about what one, one can accomplish, um, and the student presentation videos, like, like the two that you heard uh, today, they have sometimes had uh, amazing effects. Ayesha Harian. Um, gave a talk, The Immortal Coil, Existential Risks, The Dawn of the uh, Singularity. Three days after that talk was posted on YouTube, she got a call from a company she'd never heard of in uh, New York City, and she became the director of social media for that company that many famous people do, doing exciting things. She knew absolutely nothing about it. So. Um, I think there are, there are other positive things like that ha happening as a consequence of the course. And as many of you know, just this past week, we had a very su successful flipped classroom session. Many of you have heard this term. You know that it's sort of fashionable, uh, but you may not have ever really seen it in action. You can look at the latest uh, video on our course page. Uh, YouTube.com slash user Kim, Sol Kim Solas. I think you'll, you'll be amazed at that video and how fast the viewership of it is rising. We've never had a video in the course that had more than 3,000 views. I bet this will have more than uh, 3,000 views. So we, I won't go through all, all the uh, innovations, but every term in the course, there, there are new features. There was this article in the Edmonton Journal last April, really excellent article, and this is where the colors for Future Day that are 
now sh showing on, on the high level bridge where they came from or one of the places where they came from. But of course, this doesn't reach much of the student body because students don't r read newspapers. I mean, you may think they, they should or that there are students that you don't know who read them, but actually most students do not read papers. So, so this, didn't read, uh, th this didn't reach very many young people. It's an interesting world. You have a lot of people who are spending all day making nasty YouTube comments, right? I mean, this is their life. Who knows why they, they ended up as a troll, but you know, there are many people <laughs> happy as uh, YouTube trolls. And many of those people are not reading anything. I mean, they're reading their own words, but they haven't read a book for years. And so I encountered the father, just listen to this for, for a moment. It's a little bit unpredictable, I, I think. Any speaker you've had speak to you, absolutely every single one of them, their CV was growing. Some of them it was growing slowly and some it was growing faster. Every speaker always had a CV that was growing, except me. So why, why is that? Okay, so there was this online site, very active, IBM supported, internetevolution.com, and it had Thinkernet blog. And I had many video and text blog posts there, starting in 2008. And it, it, it's kind of the real world. They had people criticizing Ray Kurzweil, who never read a single one of his books, people criticizing uh, Peter Diamandis' uh, uh, Abundance, who hadn't even opened the book. They had no idea. Um, so what's the worst you can imagine happening in this Circumstances. So just think of it for a moment. I, IBM supporting this site, and you've got all these people pontificating on the basis of, as far as you know, pure opinion. Who knows where it comes from? But they, they're reading nothing, right? So <clears throat> IBM pulled the plug. On March 7th, it was in the evening. <laughs> I don't know exactly the time of the evening. Sometime in the evening of March 7th, IBM, on that Friday night, pulled all content, everything, thousands and thousands of text and video blogs from this site. And so I lost 57 items from my CV in an instant. And it's true that you, you can go into, you know, internet.org and various archive sites, but, but basically most of it's gone. Now, for me, it represents juvenilia, stuff that I wrote that's probably not as good as the things that I, I would write now. But it's quite an unusual <laughs> circumstance on a single night to lose 57 items from your CV. So you know that I'm a pathologist. You probably wonder about the technology in influence. So we have virtual microscope, virtual slide, virtual, we, 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 we have, um, image analysis, don't you imagine that one day that system is going to wake up, say, hey, Dr. Solaz, haven't you noticed you've been making a lot of mistakes recently? Don't you think I could do it better? Why don't you just stay home and let me do it? You know? So what I'm telling you, you know, we've, we, we've heard from your presentations, maybe you had the idea that some jobs are actually, you know, immune. And maybe you thought maybe my job's, you know, immune, that, that I will never be replaced, you may be replaced, I will, I, that's not how I feel. I'm, I'm, I expect this to happen. Um, and so, will there be new jobs? And I think there will be, as I said er, earlier, this, uh, jo this job of robot liaison advocate Depending upon whether you think this is like turn code or <laughs> like we're in a conflict here and you're working for the other side, but if you don't feel, feel like that, that could be a really significant job for a while. 
until the robots become better at helping each other than you know humans you know initially we'll help them find power and some other things that we're better at than they, they are but eventually there might not be anything that they need from us <clears throat> so one of the first things that they they will learn is how to bypass the on off switch um, so how, how do you figure when the lives of robots take on meaning? Like right now, you probably don't value them very highly. Do you know any robot that you'd feel really sad if that robot died? Probably not. But now, you don't know of any robots having m memories. But in, in the movies, you're f familiar with that. Like Roy Batty in Blade Runner, reaches a point where his life is going to end simply because those are the rules that, you know, they, these beings can only live so long. And he has significant, unique memories that will be lost like tears and rain. And suddenly, that is meaningful for you. That seems like this is a real loss. This is something, you know. So the idea of ro robots ha having rights will also become something of importance. How are we doing reaching people with these ideas? Our videos max out at less than 3,000. The Big Bang Theory, which talks about many of the same subjects in a comical way, reaches 20 million. So that, that's probably where we could shoot for. Um, I'm not quite sure how one would do that. Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, but the end result, if things go well, will be something very, very positive. More positive pro probably than anything you ever imagined. It's sort of the opposite of where things began um, in this talk. <coughs> So ubiquitous health, the end of war, peace, happiness everywhere, eternal youth. Isaac Asimov, science fiction writer, up to shortly before his death at age 72, referred to himself as being in my late youth. Similar situation faces all of us, but the youth will probably continue well beyond age 72, and enhanced communications will be an important part of what sustains us. So limits, do you think about limits? What limits do you think affect you? Boundaries, what boundaries? I would argue that in many areas of importance in the future, the boundaries, the limits you may be thinking of just may simply not exist. You think they're there, but they're not. The absolute barriers to you doing things that you want, that you think you can never, ever do, will be lifted. So yes, apocalypse is possible, and this may be the most definitive the end slide you've ever seen, because it's not just the end of my talk, but it's like a picture of the end. The end, the fire and ice of Robert Frost. But let's, we can influence apocalypse versus utopia. So let's work for Utopia, what do you say? Anyway, my, my goodness, that's, that's the whole talk. So, <laughs> so any, any questions? <laughs> I, I don't know much about uh, Dante. I'd, I'd like to learn more. I mean, 1300's pretty er early, eh? Yeah? What were you talking about when you meant limits? that won't exist in the future that we have today? What were you thinking? All those things that you want that you can't have. Tangible things, you know, uh, things one can own and things that one, one can experience. So the, the, the price of valuable goods in a utopian cir circumstance comes, comes down to approximately zero. So. Um, anything tangible you want, you can have, and any experience, because virtual reality will become 
as good as real reality and can be shared with friends or so that I just simply mean that you have always accepted, you know, there are things you want you can't have. The world changes quite, quite a bit when it turns out that you can have anything that you want. How, how, how do you make sense of the plan of your life if that is really true? How, how do you spend your time? Um, what is your motivation? Yeah. So anyway, that's what I meant about boundaries and limits and the ones you think of now just may not exist. <clears throat> yeah? So do you think utopia is a good thing then? There, there, there is no, <laughs> I don't know. Is that, is, that a, is that a silly question? Because like, if there's, if you can get everything without working, putting any effort in, what's the point? No, no, but the, see, that's what I was saying before. Yeah. That's defining the human being as we define them today, right? right? In this world, we, we will change. I don't know how, how we will change, or we'll change. Because right now, if somebody asks, hey, who, who are you? You immediately describe your job, because mm -hmm. that's the way you feel about yourself. What makes you a person is whatever you're doing, your job. That this is the most important thing about you. That certainly will change. What the alternative will be, I don't know. You'll, you'll say, well, you know, I write a certain kind of poetry and, you know, th th this is my clout score. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know how you will define yourself. Yeah. But it, it is, I thought it was a very, almost very profound question in a sense because at least it, it seems to me there's an element of, even the people who seem to be in, what you consider the best jobs, there's still an element of suffering they they, they describe. They still, you know, even the wealthiest person, I, I, you know, some people who are very wealthy say, oh yeah, it was a hard day. And then maybe maybe they're just being nice to all of us by saying, well, wow, I have it amazing, and I'm just trying to relate to you. But it right. seems that if you look at literature, if you look at, you know, how, how things have evolved, people seem to have, the need, maybe not even for suffering, but for, for some, for going through some kind of hardship to make it worthwhile and have a certain sense of joy. It seems it seems in a sense like if you have a story, I just say there was there was a prince and a princess and they lived happily ever after. Like, okay, well whatever. <laughs> there, there's something that happens in the story. Yeah. That no, the 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 struggle um, you know, like I guess this the struggle to, you know, attain whatever you're want, wanting to attain is still there until the robots perfect that. Like if you're writing poetry, you know, romantic poetry, a particular kind of poetry, you can write down what the objects are and you're not there yet, so there's still a struggle where you're achieving that. But what happens when the robots figure that out and they can, just like they can do a perfect game of chess and checkers and so on, they, they can now write the perfect poem then yeah, that, that's, a, that's a problem. Your struggle's gone. I mean, you can still struggle if you want, but you can just go out and get the perfect poem from the robot. So yeah, life takes on a different meaning. I don't know if it means it's without me meaning. Don't you think we will evolve and, and, and there'll be new meaning? You know, we've found new meaning in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also the interesting thing that I said, I, I wasn't booked as a captain. Dale Carnegie's How to Friends and Influence People. And that was, what I, there's a lot of it's like, okay, you know, there's a lot of it's evolved beyond that book. I mean, it's profound right. its time. Right. But one of the things that was amazing was saying people have an additional human need and that is the need to feel important. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you look in a sense of maybe how ISIS is getting, you know, people to do such horrendous things, what they're offering to somebody who's become so, or feels so hopeless is, hey, here's something where you can, you can feel important. Here's this final battle, this struggle that you can yep. that you can that you can build towards, and it's it's it, you know it's it's terribly perverse and causes so much horrendousness. But it's I, I wonder if there's something to that. Yeah. Well, I th I think we 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 just have to realize that the way to analyze these situations is never to assume that any one component is staying fixed. Mm -hmm. Like the basic characteristics of human beings remain fixed 
and all these other things change, I don't think that that's where our basic characteristics will somehow change. Okay, so the, the rules are we, we, we have to be out of here. So, yeah, <laughs> one minute. So, okay. I worked till 9.30, but I made it over as quickly yeah, as possible. Good, but good. I thought you did an amazing speech. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much.